aren't we try to do this every year, try to see what are some of those cultural trends, what are some of the things that are happening in the news that we need to understand, not what should we think about this necessarily, uh, but how should we think about this? Is there a Christian perspective on these things? Or does the Bible help us to understand these particular things happening around us in our culture or help us to better engage with our culture that we might not get to if we traveled through a book of the Bible uh, from the start to the end. And so that's what we're doing in this series. Today, we're going to be looking at uh, how, how do we as Christians, you as an individual, me as an individual, how do we as a church, so a body, like an organized body like we are here at a church, how do we or Perhaps should we, certainly how can we, best engage with experts? Why experts? I'm glad you asked, or at least sat there with a blank look on your face. <laughs> experts, uh, over the last couple of years, uh, has you know the, our collective trust as individuals and across, especially the Western world, our trust in experts has had a nosedive. Uh, in some categories, trust is at an all-time low. Uh, after trust being at an all-time high in experts about three years ago. So just after the pandemic hit, trust in experts was at an all-time high. Collectively, across the world, we went, what the heck are we supposed to do? What, what are we supposed to do with this thing? Who, where are the grown-ups at? Like, where are all the adults? Uh, and some people went, I'm an adult. I have domain expertise. Let me tell you what to do. And people were like, yes, someone's telling us what to do. Very quickly after that, trust in experts started to slide. And in some categories, like uh, research that came out recently said that uh, in these categories, trust in scientists generally is down. Trust in school principals is down. Trust in religious leaders uh, is down. Trust in journalists, all-time low. Literally the lowest public trust in journalists of all time. Business leaders down. Elected officials, trust was already pretty low. Trust has dropped the last three years. Uh, medical scientists and medical profession, trust is down. Uh, in a different survey, uh, across um, developed countries, they were trying to understand this phenomenon of the trust in expert or the expert class or people who are domain experts going down. They did, a res they did some research and uh, about half of the population, the respondents said, experts exaggerate conclusions from the data. So they said, we trust experts to collect good data. We don't trust them to tell us what that data means. Or um, about half said that experts don't properly present the full picture. So again, they get the data, but they only select the data that is going to suit them, or they only um, find data in a way that will um, present the picture that they want to present. Nearly half of respondents say that experts present opinion or rumor as fact. So about half. And I'm, I'm trying to say this is true of experts. I'm trying to say that the trust, our collective trust in experts is down. Who we look to as experts has broadened. So it used to be that certain philosophers, people who had uh, attained a certain degree of education or expertise in, an, in, a, in a field were looked at as experts, whereas now people who can confidently communicate an opinion are also seen as experts. So while trust in experts has gone down, the people we look to as experts has increased. And what's happened is we have a lack of what people call epistemic trust. I promise you it's the only big word we're going to use today. Epistemic referring to knowledge or, or things that can be known or how we know things. And trust obviously meaning trust. Our trust in knowledge. It's our confidence <clears throat> that the information someone's telling you is trustworthy and relevant. So uh, in in this kind of field of epistemic trust, that talk about there is truth, right? In this bucket here, we've got the truth. And this might be what those respondents were referring to as the data. And then out from the data, we develop beliefs. And then we put our beliefs out in the open 
and then we justify those beliefs. This is how the academic process has tended to go. This is, how, this is basically how the scientific process uh, has gone for hundreds of years. And <clears throat> what's started to happen is, based on the data, is that people don't start with the data anymore. They start with the belief and then they justify that belief or back up that belief and we get into this loop of belief and justification abstract of truth or abstract of data. And as the number of experts has increased exponentially and our access to self-proclaimed experts or people who've done the research by watching 100 YouTube videos uh, can say, I'm an expert, we can actually now go to, we can engage with experts by curating the information we take in to only confirm our pre-held biases so that we can just stay in this loop of belief and justification, or this post hoc rationalization of a belief we already have. This is the premise of, uh, of why we're talking about it today. We are called to be a people of truth. So as we, as Christians, individuals and corporately, look at the problem of epistemic trust around us, and we even look at uh, not just religious leaders, but religious people, trust has gone down. Trust is just, across the board, gone down. People who were very well trusted before are trusted less now. People who weren't trusted much before, uh, again, their, their trust has kind of fallen through, the, fallen through the toilet. We tend to err at two ends of the spectrum when it comes to trust or when it comes to looking at information. We either have people who we already listen to or like to listen to, people who have confirmed things that we already know, and we go to them because they're going to tell us what to think. And we trust them. And whatever they tell us, we believe. And then the other end of the spectrum, there are people who we don't trust, and it doesn't matter even if they told us something that if someone else said it, we would agree with, because they said it, we go, well, I don't know about that, because I don't trust them. Not, not you guys, this is people out there, obviously, uh, uh, operating at either end of the extremes. Obviously, you intelligent people are you know, interrogating data and, uh, and traveling with nuance and whatnot. Have a think about the sources of information in your life. Who are the authors you read? <clears throat> Who are the podcasts you listen to? The YouTubers, uh, TikTokers, or I don't know, do you guys listen to philosophers? Preachers, consider the people that you listen to and then consider the things that they say. When they say things that you disagree with or that you haven't heard before, are those the kind of sources that you go, oh, okay, I trust this person. They confidently communicate. I can just receive and incorporate into my worldview, into my understanding the things that they're saying. Or are the people who, no matter what they say, you're going to be very suspicious or you won't even listen to them, because why would I listen to them? What could they possibly offer for me? <clears throat> or are people just in your own life? We've got people we trust, people we don't trust, people we go to for certain types of information, people we will listen to and we will do the subconscious work of negotiating what they have to say. For example, you probably trust your doctor. I hope you trust your doctor, or at least I hope you have a trustworthy doctor. And when she or when he says to you, this is my medical opinion or diagnosis that you would have some trust of that person or you might have a good mechanic you go to the good mechanic with your car and when they're telling you about your alternator or about your starter engine or whatever you'd say okay I can trust you about that but if your doctor says you know tries to help you with your alternator you might go well okay I know I can trust you and you're a trustworthy person but you're talking outside of your area of expertise or you wouldn't go to your mechanic and say hey, what do you think about this rash here it's just started uh, it's real itchy. You, you wouldn't do that. And so already in your life, you already have a framework for dealing with knowledge, dealing with truth. We, we're living in, some people call it, a post-truth culture, where your truth is your, is, is your truth. Truth is actually subjective. Whatever you like, that's great for you. Who am I to question your truth? But we are people who believe that there is an underlying or ultimate truth. In fact, Jesus himself said, I am 
the truth. And he has revealed himself to us. He's revealed the truth to us. Not every truth about everything. Uh, Then, you know, uh, the curiosity he gave us would be useless and we wouldn't get to learn things and grow in things and understand more about the world and more about God. That's one of the most amazing things about being human, actually, is growing in knowledge and, and our wonder increases as our knowledge increases, or at least could increase. <clears throat> God has revealed himself in nature in a general sense. He's revealed himself specifically or explicitly in his scriptures. And he's revealed himself really ultimately in the person and work of Jesus and in the Holy Spirit who indwells every believer now and who's at work in the world. So for us, we're a people of truth. We want to benefit from experts. Man, I love that there are people who have dedicated tens of thousands of hours looking at smaller and smaller and narrower and narrower um, uh, fields in their particular subject to give us deeper and greater knowledge about things that hopefully, ultimately, will aid all of humanity or at least help us understand uh, the way the world works and, and all of which gives us more figurative ammo with which to worship God who created it all. I'm glad for this. But at the same time, <clears throat> uh, some of our experts have rightly lost trust. People were asking me this morning after the gathering saying, what's an example of, of this? And the first thing that comes to mind, in fact, I think we hit peak epistemic trust in our experts Uh, at the point in the pandemic when some experts came out and said things like uh, you don't need a mask we need we need the masks for our um, our PPE for our medical professions don't you get a mask and then six weeks later those same professionals would come out and saying oh we only said that you do need a mask we only said that so that we could have the masks we need for our medical professionals, and a whole generation of people went, hang on a second. <clears throat> so you lied to us to produce a preferred outcome. People went, wait a second. And since then, trust in our experts has, in some cases, had a nosedive. But I, but I, I want to make the case for experts tonight. And I want to make a case for how we should engage with or how we can helpfully engage with experts and knowledge. That's my intro. Let me pray and let's get stuck into some scripture. Father God, I want to thank you for revealing yourself to us in your creation, in your scriptures, in the person and work of Jesus by your Holy Spirit even now. And so, Father, give us open hearts and minds to your Holy Spirit, to your scriptures as we read them. Help us, Father, to know how to handle truth. Help us to be committed to truth. But we don't want to be gullible. We don't want to be fooled. We certainly don't want to be proclaiming falsehood as truth. And so help us in every way, in Jesus' name. Amen. So where do we start? How do we start? Uh, Firstly, I'd say, number one, our plumb line is... The word of God. So plumb line is the, the measure by which we can measure anything else. Let me tell you uh, from scripture. There's, a, there's you may be aware, uh, an apostle called Paul. is traveling around recorded in the book of Acts. This is what it says of Paul. It says, as soon as it was night, the brothers and sisters sent Paul and Silas away to Berea, where the Bereans lived. Upon arrival, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. The people here were of more noble character than those in Thessalonica, since they received the word with eagerness and examined the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. Consequently, many of them believed. So here we have a people who are committed to truth, people who want the truth. And when they hear something amazing, they've been waiting for this knowledge, probably for their whole lives, but maybe for many, many generations. They've been waiting for this Messiah, waiting for the good news. How is God going to come and deliver his people? And here's this guy, random Paul, who came into the synagogue and said, here it is. Here he is. It's Jesus. And the Bereans were committed to the truth. They're like, we love this. It's what we've been waiting for. However, 
we're going to go to our ultimate source of truth to see if these things you say are so. And they are commended for being people of truth. So actually they're more noble because they didn't just hear and go, that sounds awesome, or you are a compelling orator, or you speak real good. But we want, to, we want the truth. <clears throat> we don't want to fall in line with uh, a charismatic leader or someone who is, a, again, a persuasive or convincing or, or someone who uh, could just make really good arguments. We want the truth. We want to know, ultimately, is this actually real? I put it to you, we need to be these kinds of people. No matter who's doing the talking or what the subject is, that we would be people who go hard after the truth. We want to be the people of truth. The Bereans knew where to go to find the truth about what Paul was speaking about. It was in the Word of God. And we need to pursue, pursue truth, starting with, again, the ultimate truth in the Word of God. And then when the Scriptures are silent, or when they don't tell us, you know, thou shalt operate like this when your neighbour does that, or when there's a global pandemic, this is explicitly how you should act. We want to use that discernment, and we are still people of truth. We need to go pursue that truth where it may be found. Why? Again, because we're people of truth. We don't want to compromise our integrity. Paul writes to the Ephesians, he says, uh, make sure you are equipped with the belt of truth. It's part of the armor of God. It's what we need to wear to be effective in the world. He says, make sure you're wearing the belt of truth because we are a people of truth who follow our king who is the truth. He writes to the Corinthians, he says, love rejoices with the truth. We're people of love and love rejoices with the truth. Doesn't mean that we, we just need to proclaim the truth and then that will be loving. We can communicate truth in a way that's unloving, but we must at least be people of truth. And he writes this to the Philippians. He says, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any moral excellence, excellence and if there's anything praiseworthy, dwell on these things. Hey man, you are people of truth. Make sure you look like, smell like, sound like the truth. Dwell on these things. Remain in these things. Think about these things. We need to engage with a marketplace of ideas, with an ever-increasing number of influencers and self-proclaimed experts, or even legitimate experts. We have to be a people of truth. Secondly, so we don't compromise our witness. Can't tell you how many people I meet who have, you know, the, I was going to say figurative auntie or uncle, but I mean literal auntie or uncle, who has been swept into a, an unhelpful or false or gullible way of thinking, which has rendered their witness ineffective. Because the people in the life go, can't listen to auntie or uncle because they're super gullible. They don't believe anything. Or they're way off on this tangent. Or they're way off on that tangent. And, and I mean that at like both ends of the spectrum and everywhere in between. We can't compromise our witness by neglecting the truth. We have to be people of the truth. Can't get sloppy here. We've got to believe it and we've got to speak the truth. And when we get something wrong, <clears throat> we need to be the people who say, I was wrong. Not the people who double down to save face or because we want to win an argument. We're not in the business of winning arguments, actually. We're in the business of winning people. And we do that by actually pursuing the truth. Because if you are known not as a gullible person, but as a person who pursues the truth and when wrong, you can say, oh, I changed my mind. Uh, then you'll be a trustworthy person someone who someone can listen to. <clears throat> it's interesting about um, repentance. We, sometimes we tend to water repentance down to merely uh, contrition or saying sorry or feeling bad about something 
Or sometimes I've heard people say, um, and rightly so, there's an element of this, that repentance is, I was going in this direction and now I'm doing a 180 and I'm going in this direction. So certainly there's an aspect of that to repentance. But a more robust understanding of repentance is actually more like a change of mind. So it's coming into alignment with how God thinks. That's repentance. That's, that's, that's true repentance. Is I thought this way and now I think this way. I'm in line with how God thinks. And so sometimes, <clears throat> not just talking about spiritual things, talking about anything, when we believe something that we learn to be later not true, or there's nuance to it, we need to be the people who aren't clinging to our... clinging to our public persona, but clinging to the truth. How then are we best to engage with experts and knowledge? Well, firstly, we need to be truth seekers like the Bereans, actually commit to being people of the truth, holding fast what we know to be true. We often talk about things being in a closed hand and things being in an open hand, knowledge that we hold in a closed hand, things we know to be true, that we aren't, we aren't, grasping to keep them away from other people. We're grasping onto them like our life depends on it, like the character and the nature of God, like the gospel of Jesus. We cling to those things, um, like our life depends on it, because it does. And there are other things, other knowledge, that we hold with an open hand, even important things that we want to hold here. We're still holding them. We're still, we're still behaving in light of them. We're still living our lives like we believe them because we do, but we hold them in the open hand so that if... We can be corrected by Scripture, if, there, if it's a theological thing, or by new or better knowledge, then we can lose the things that aren't true and bring in the things that are true. If we walk around with everything in a closed fist or only going to those places or people on the internet that will confirm our biases, then we're just, again, stuck in that loop of belief and justifying our beliefs, never actually going to the truth. We're not actually people who want the truth in that situation? What is people who want to feel good about what we already believe? That's not how we are to be. First Thessalonians, Paul writes, don't despise prophecies or don't despise truth-telling, but test all things, hold on to what is good, stay away from every kind of evil. He says, we've got to test everything. We don't want to be gullible people for our own sake and for our witness. We want to be people of the truth who are searching for the truth, who are clinging to it when we find it. We're people of the truth. We need to engage humbly as well. So when we hear something that we think, that doesn't sound right, or that challenges my beliefs in this middle column, we don't then just rush to my favorite commentator to kind of, you know, pat me on the, on the mind and say, no, 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 you're cool, mate. Well, you, what you believe is, is fine. Just stay over here. But we can actually go and engage broadly because we hold those things in an open hand. Because we want the truth. We don't want to live in this, the comfort, confirmation bias circle. We want to go to the truth. And when we do engage with people who we really enjoy, we need to engage with them in the same kind of way that we would engage with someone that we disagree, with whom we disagree. We don't want to just receive everything. We want to actually always run it through the filter of, is this true? Is this credible? What is this person's incentives? Now, do they have domain expertise? Are they an experienced practitioner? Do they have a record of truth-telling? Or are they just helping me to stay in my little bubble? We've got to do this because we're the people of truth. It's one of the reasons I love science. I'm not a scientist. I'm not a practitioner of science. Certainly not an expert in science. I really like science. Love finding out more about how the world works. Uh, genuinely, like I said before, it helps me to worship God all the more. Going, man, that is absolutely amazing. What I like about science is, it's this cycle of, well, here's my hypothesis, or here's, here's what I think is true. Let me put it on the table. Let me test it. Let me test my hypothesis. Let me then present it, present my findings. And then I'm going to leave it on the table. So that other people can come in and they can test it. They can scrutinize it. They can develop it. They can refute it. And it leads to, all going well, better knowledge and greater truth. We get into trouble when, 
In fact, I think this is part of the test all things and hold on to what is good, the implication being jettison what is unhelpful or false. The problem then only comes when we take data and we chop it up to only then present it in ways that we that will uh, push our, again, belief and justification circle. How else? We need to learn broadly, read, watch, listen broadly. Proverbs uh, is full of this recommendation. Proverbs 15, plans fail when there's no counsel, but with many advisors they succeed. 15 again, a discerning mind seek knowledge, seeks knowledge, but the mouth of fools feeds on foolishness. Again, we don't want to just give in to confirmation bias. Even if this person we love is right 90% of the time, we need to be running it through our filter always because when that 10% comes, it has the potential to lead us off of the path of truth. We're not people who follow experts. We're people who are pursuing truth. And to the degree that those experts help us get to the truth, we love those experts. <clears throat> Take journalists, for example. Uh, at one stage, a very long time ago, like 25, 26 years ago, I trained as a journalist. I worked in media for about 15 years. When I was trained, when I was at university, the thing that every single lecturer, tutor, academic text, there was one thing that everybody agreed on, and that is when you're a journalist, you want to abstract yourself from what you present. Don't bring in your emotion. Don't bring in your... You're not bringing your opinion. You're not editorializing. What you want to do is, as objectively as possible, present the facts. And people can draw and derive their own meaning from those facts. Your job is to be transparent, high fidelity. You want to just hear, here's the data. Help me understand the data. Don't push an understanding of the data. It was objectivism was the goal. Today, activism is the goal. Once was objectivism, now is activism. Where once, uh, literally, in one of the lectures, they showed <clears throat> news footage, this, this reel of uh, the Hindenburg disaster, this big balloon blimp that caught on fire. People died. And one of the reporters got very emotional. You might have heard that. Oh, the humanity. And the lecturer is like, we don't do that. We don't inject emotion into reporting. We want to report the facts as they are. And these days, that's, that is not how most people receive their information and news. Where again, once was objectivism, now it's activism. Activist journalists, and not just journalists, influencers, YouTubers, TikTokers, presenting not the facts as they are, here, draw your own conclusions and meaning, but emotionally delivered, curated data, which most persuasively presents their case or cause, or preferred course of action, preferred read, preferred outcome. That's what's happened in the industry that, that I was in for half my adult life, most of my adult life. We've got to know how information is being communicated if we're going to be able to process it well and get to the truth. This is why I say learn, read, watch, listen broadly. I like to listen. I'm a bit of a politics nerd. I really like politics. I also studied politics at uni. I love to listen to people who are way out on the right and way out on the left. Um, I want to hear how people are Speaking about things, I find actually there's less and less around the middle. There's a lot more kind of on the edges. What I'm listening for is, where do these people agree? Where they agree on nothing else? Uh, where they hate to agree with each other, but where do they agree? Where do their opinions intersect? I'm not saying that's going to be the truth. But I'm saying that is a helpful place to start. But if you're not reading, listening, watching broadly or widely, you really only get one perspective. And people <clears throat> these days, especially on that activism or activist reporting or um, journalist spectrum, people tend to not say, yeah, I am, I am on the far left or I am on the far right. They, everybody tends to think that they're very moderate 
everyone tends to think that they're the neutral, kind of secular, uh, speaking for the people, and uh, everybody else is kind of out on the edges. But we need to do this work. If we don't do the work, we won't get to the truth. How else? Thirdly, we need to embed ourselves in community. When we abstract ourselves from community or when we choose our own community, and it's so easy to do this online now. I don't, <clears throat> I don't have to deal with anybody I disagree with if I don't want to. If I choose my own community and I go online and I find like the slither of the slither of the slither of the slither of the tribe that, I, that only agrees with everything that I already believe, will, will confirm all of my biases, will keep me stuck in this loop of belief and justifying my belief, then I don't have to ever deal with anything that is contrary to what I already believe. Or if I do, it's only by demonizing those evil people out there. But if we're actually in, if we're embedded in community, like again, Proverbs, uh, one who listens to life-giving rebukes will be home among the wise. But a mocker who doesn't love one who corrects him, he will, uh, sorry, a mocker doesn't love one who corrects him, he will not consult the wise. Or Proverbs 15 again, anyone who ignores discipline despises himself, but whoever listens to correction acquires good sense. When we're in community with people who don't agree with us, or, or at least who are, we are all, even though we disagree or have a diversity of opinion on many different things, we all agree that we are people of truth pursuing the truth, and that, that truth can be known. Then when I say something that's not right, or you say something that's not right, because we're in community, we can say, that doesn't sound right to me. Where'd you get that idea? Where's that coming from? Who are you listening to? Have you just been iteratively curating a community that keeps you stuck in this unfruitful, unhelpful loop of confirmation bias. We need to be in community with people who are dissatisfied with anything but the truth. And man, you want to check on your own thinking. I want to check on my thinking. I do. We need, we need experts, again, people who spend those thousands and thousands of hours delving deep into one tiny little topic to help us understand. And we need people in our own lives who we're going to bump up against, who can be vulnerable with and, and share with them. I've been learning about this. This is what I heard. I think it sounds reasonable to me. What do you think? And let people speak into our lives to challenge us. We need it. I've mentioned this study before. I find this fascinating. Uh, Yale Law School professor Dan Cahan he, had a, he did some research, he uh, presented a paper called Motivated Numeracy and Enlightened Self-Government. I really only say that in case you want to go look it up later, you don't have to remember that now. Here's basically what he did. He wanted to see how do, for people who are stuck in this belief justification loop, how do we interpret data? And so what he did was, <clears throat> he presented some data, and he said, this data relates to skin cream. Can you tell me what the data says? And he brought in a wide range of people. And on the whole, people could say, yeah, this is what the data says about this skin cream. And he's like, great, people can interpret the data. Then he, then he kind of only just kind of took away the headline, uh, the topic. He said, this is no longer about skin cream. This is about a political topic. Same data. Presented it to people and people lost their minds. They couldn't interpret the data. They were stuck in this loop, and when data came in, they only interpreted the data according to their previously held beliefs. And he's like, what's going on here? We know people can interpret the data. It's easy data to interpret. But when people are not people pursuing the truth, but only pursuing a post hoc rationalization of their previously held beliefs, I can't even interpret the data. And here's the craziest part about his research. The better someone was at maths, the smarter the person who was doing the research was, the less likely they were to be able to interpret the data when it related to politics. The better they could um, convert the data to meaning accurately when it was skin cream, the less likely 
they could accurately interpret it, the smarter they were. Isn't that outrageous? What it says to me is we must put a check even on our own understanding that I'm not sitting in the place of judgment over knowledge as it comes to me. I am merely a participant with people I'm in community with in our collective search for truth. Fourth, we need to ask God for wisdom. We need to verify wisdom or or knowledge when it comes in. This is what James writes. If anyone lacks wisdom, ask God, who gives to all generously and ungrudgingly. Again, we don't need to go around doubting everything everybody says. Uh, Certainly, we don't want to just receive everything everyone says. Um, I like to think of it, again, like that scientific method where we want to put new knowledge on a table, kind of sits in our inbox, our figurative inbox. We're not just receiving new information, even from people that we trust and incorporating it immediately into our worldview. We're putting it on the table. We're looking at it. We're scrutinizing it. We're testing it to see that it's true. We even get other people, more eyes on it. We want to read more broadly and go to people in our community and say, here's this idea. What do you think about it? And then when... We do the work, and it's true. Then we can incorporate it into our understanding, into our worldview. I say this even for things that people who stand up here and say. You shouldn't just take what I say as if it's always ultimately the truth. I, I try very hard, I, I promise you, I try very hard to do the work of research, <clears throat> of um, being in Scripture, of reading broadly and listening and learning broadly so that when I communicate, I take seriously the charge that James says that teachers will be judged more harshly. I don't ever want to communicate anything falsely. But if the Bereans are commended for taking what Paul said, putting it on the table and searching to see if it is true, you should definitely be doing that with me. We've got to do it because we're the people who pursue the truth. We're people who believe that the truth uh, has been revealed. Again, in, in nature, in Scripture, in the person and work of Jesus, by the Holy Spirit. Uh, God wants to be known. He wants to reveal more about Himself. And He wants to reveal more about His creation. So truth can be known. And we want to pursue that truth together. So we don't blindly trust people. We want to do the work of verifying what they've said is true. And then we can hold fast to it. And lastly, like we said every week, we need to understand there is no default, neutral, secular worldview. It's not like well, we have this Christian understanding and we're going to bring it into the neutral marketplace. There's no neutral marketplace. There's no, there's no neutral default worldview. There's a Dominant worldview in our culture, which is different and distinct from other cultures that have dominant worldviews, but each are just competing worldviews. And so for us, we don't need to be bashful. We don't need to be shy about saying, this is what I believe is the truth, and offer that into the marketplace of ideas. But only when we've done the work, only when we're confident that it's true, not confident from this unhelpful confirmation bias, but going to the truth, going to the sources of truth, going to the scriptures to find out about God, about his character, about his work in the world, going to experts who are trustworthy, who are doing the work to help us understand the rest of the world and even to help us understand the scriptures. It brings us back to point one. And again, we need to, Do the work of the brains. Hold fast to what is true. Reject and even repent, if it's appropriate, where we've got things wrong. Uh, We need to be people of integrity, people who are trustworthy, people who don't just believe the truth but speak the truth, people who uh, hold open-handed information truly in an open hand so that we can nuance and grow and learn, cling to those close-handed things like our life depends on it because it does. And then be people of truth uh, in our witness as well. So we're never compromising our witness, never being known as gullible people. I, I don't mind 
being known as a fool who believes in fairy tales, like, you know, the, the sky daddy. I don't, I don't mind that um, insult. Uh, but to be known as a conspiracy theorist or a, a, you know, a gullible person because I haven't done the work with knowledge that's known to be true, uh, I don't want to compromise my witness on the things that I know are true, that do sound like foolishness to the world. Does this make sense? I'm going to do the work of the Bereans. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you for making yourself known to us. You're really good to us. Constantly and consistently, thank you for revealing yourself to us in creation, in your scriptures. Thank you for revealing yourself to us in Jesus and still speaking to us by his spirit and by his scriptures. Help us to do the work, Father. Help us. We want to be people of truth. You've made us people of truth. We want to be people of truth. Certainly about things theological, but about other things as well. So help us, Father, to be humble in our pursuit of truth, but also to be bold in our proclamation of those things we know to be true. We don't want to be fools who just believe things that sound good or confirm our already held ideas. We want to be people, again, Father, who... Uh, know and speak and live in light of the truth and say, help us. Help us to have understanding. Help us to discern. Help us to stay close to your spirit. Help us in community, uh, in, in love for one another, to challenge and be challenged. Help us to be forthright where we need to be forthright. Meek where we need to be meek. In every way, help us to bring you glory in Jesus' name. Amen.